don't block the, the path of inquiry. Don't lay down rules that make it impossible for people to ask important questions. Welcome to the Thought Stretchers podcast, where we hope to stretch your thinking about important issues in education through rich inquiry. My name is Drew Perkins, and I'm your host for these conversations for complexity and nuance. Hello again, and thanks as always for tuning in. I wanted to share a couple of notes on some things that we have coming up and going on around here. First off is a reminder that if you're interested in learning more about project-based learning as an individual or a small group, I would invite you to check out our PBL Grow 24 event, which is coming up in June, June 24th through 26th in our home base of Louisville, Kentucky. This event is limited to 40 seats, so it's not meant to be a big event, and those spots are starting to fill up. So if you're interested, now's the time to register. And I'd also like to invite you to our Thought Stretchers education community, which you can find at thoughtstretchers.org. Some of you have been in on some of those events that we're holding online, and we're starting to gain some traction and get some momentum and have some really intellectually nourishing conversations. So if you're interested in something like that, please do check out thoughtstretchers.org and sign in and sign up and join us for some of those events. And of course, don't forget about our main professional development website at wegrowteachers.com. We have our project-based learning workshops there, our inquiry and differentiated instruction workshops. We also are offering artificial intelligence workshops and objective pluralism. So if you're looking to grow your school, please go to wegrowteachers.com. And if you have any questions, comments, concerns, or ideas for me, you can email me at drew at thoughtstretchers.org. In this episode, I spoke with Shaka Mitchell, who is a senior fellow for the American Federation for Children. AFC is an advocacy group for school choice. We started our conversation by talking about the bill in Kentucky that is going to be put to voters in November to become an amendment to allow more school choice and some of the factors and features around that. I pushed him a little bit on concerns that I and many have on public money being spent in religious institutions, so we explored that a bit. I also really tried to make the point about the importance of quality versus just more choices, and we explored that quite a bit, and used the example of schools that might teach things that are not actual truth. We also talked about the need, or at least my perceived need, for some sort of common denominator for quality and how leadership might push for something like that and the issues of polarization and us versus them and the ways in which advocacy groups like AFC or folks in the school choice movement might navigate that and engage in that and some of the problems that are inherent in that. I certainly appreciate Shaka allowing me to push him on some things. We had a good conversation, lots of complexity and nuance on an important issue. So here is that conversation. I am with Shaka Mitchell, who is with the American Federation for Children. He's going to give a better description of who he is and what he does and all those kinds of things. But we're here to talk about school choice and some of the legislation that's passed in our home state, but beyond. Uh, But before we get into any of that, let's give Shaka that opportunity to say hello and uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself and the work that you're doing. Yeah, thanks, Drew. Um, As you mentioned, I'm a senior fellow at the American Federation for Children, and ASC is a national nonprofit. We work in about 20, 25 states at any given point um, in the year, and our goal is really to make sure that all kids can access um, an education that best meets their needs, and um, irrespective of where they live, irrespective of um, their family's income, we just think that um, that school choice or educational choice um, ought to be something that every family can access. And so we're really sector agnostic, meaning, you know, we don't, um, we don't really care. Uh, and, and personally, I certainly don't really care if you've got a zoned public school that works well for your family, that's great. Um, but the question is, if not, then what do you do? And so we, we work to support uh, whether it's charter laws or, uh, private choice laws like vouchers, education, savings accounts, things like that. Um, and then we work to tell parents about their options. And, you know, a little bit personally, I'm I'm based in Nashville and I've got three school-aged daughters. So, you know, we're we're walking alongside parents ourselves and just trying to kind of figure it out from year to year. Hmm. And what what's your background before you came to this work? Yeah. 
Um, well, by training, I'm a lawyer, um, but I didn't spend a ton of time in in practice, though I did work at a place called the Institute for Justice, which is a constitutional law firm based in uh, just outside Washington, D.C., and we did um, a lot of pro bono representation, did a lot of work working with families uh, in the school choice area. Um, I was then a, an administrator for um, a few different charter school networks, so I helped open oh, uh, about half a dozen charter schools in mm-hmm. Uh, in Nashville, and you know that's a that is not a single person who does that. That's a, a big team. It takes a lot of people to do that. So I was part of teams that did that, and um, but really just came to the work because I really believe in the power of education and just what it can do, and um, that it's the the surest way to sort of climb the 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 ladder to the American dream. Okay, so I'm assuming, but correct me if I'm wrong. So you, I, I, assuming you have a law degree, although recently I've seen that lawyers apparently in some states don't need law degrees anymore or won't need law degrees or mm. past past the bar. I guess that's the that's the thing. Uh, so yeah, I was not had, so lucky. Yeah, yeah. So you uh, assumingly passed the bar and were a lawyer before becoming one of those administrators for a charter school. Uh, correct. So I was a. Um, Right out of right out of college, um, went to law school, and then was uh, was a- actually I was in D.C. and I was working at an education policy shop. So I I knew in fact that I was not really that interested in, in the practice of law. Hmm. I was more interested in justice. Okay. Um, if that distinction makes a difference, and um, and so I went to work in D.C. working in education. It was right at the time when um, the No Child Left Behind law had been passed in 01 Um, i got to dc in 04 so it was a it was a really interesting time right lots of things were happening at the state and local level and so it was a great time for me to sort of just learn more about the system um kind of from a policy standpoint and then um when i moved to tennessee then i was working directly um, in schools and you know was there and that's that's a, a again a very different experience from the policy world Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine. Uh, so the AFC, I guess one of the questions that, that may be relevant before we get into too much of the, the weeds is how is a, the American Federation for Children different from some of the other school choice advocacy groups that are out there? I know we've talked, uh, I've talked with some folks, um, uh, you know, School Choice Week and uh, I've drawn a blank on the name of that. Andrew Campanella, I think is his name. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious how you make those distinctions from other groups. Yeah, um, a, a few different ways. I mean, you know, first of all, I'd say it's just it's such a big country that it takes a lot of, um, there are a lot of organizations that are doing work in any given issue. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, so that's one thing to recognize. I I mean, I think at its core education is, um, is really, really local. I would say it's, it's almost individual, like at the family level. And Mm -hmm. so I think there are some things that, that you can't really do from a, say a national, um, organization. And then, um, vice versa, I think there's some things that are really challenging for, say, an individual family to do, right? And so AFC, I think of a, us as um, kind of a, an, a school choice, like supply chain organization, meaning we at the end of the day, we want to make sure that that parents have great options for their children, right? And so so some of the work that we're doing is to work with parents and tell them about say the scholarship opportunities um, available in their schools. So that's that's the that's where we want to end up. Well, to get there, sometimes you need laws passed um, in states that even allow for those things, right? And so we work in state legislatures, um, sometimes consulting on on draft uh, legislation, um, sometimes coming to testify and, and give testimony about what we've seen in other places, conducting what I would say is sort of light research. So that's that middle block. And then, you know, somebody told me once, like the the best way to know if a law is going to pass is to know who is going to vote for it. And so we also engage in um, electoral work. And so we've got a a related um, uh, pack that will engage in electoral work, and it's nonpartisan. And so um, for folks that support uh, school choice issues as we see them, then 
um, then we may be supportive of them in elections. So it's sort of supply chain. So it's a, a, we hit every link in that chain, and I don't know of other organizations that do that. Hmm. Yeah, well, one of the things that has happened, of course, here in our home base state of Kentucky is the passing of, I think it's called House Bill 2, which is now, as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, going to be on the ballot for voters to decide whether or not to, I guess, ratify that or uh, what, I don't know, what the correct exact wordage wording should be. But tell us, uh, to the extent that you're aware of the details of that, what is it that this bill in Kentucky, and then we can kind of broaden that conversation, uh, what is it meaning to do mm-hmm. and um, you know, kind of your thoughts on it, I guess? Yeah, and and so by way of a little bit of background for um, maybe some of your listeners, um, many people uh, know, but probably not everybody's aware that like education is really dealt with at the state level, right? So there's no right, right. Um, education is not part of the United States Constitution. Mm-hmm. So um, when you want to know what's possible in the world of education the first place to look is really to a state constitution. And so, and, and states vary. Um, there's a lot of similarity, but you know, it's 50 states, it's the laboratory of the states. And so we get different language. Mm-hmm. Kentucky's um, state constitution is really um, quite unique in that the, the constitution says that, you know, the general assembly, the state legislature um, will provide for an, quote, efficient system of common schools throughout the state. Now, th- that's not the unique part. A lot of states do that. They mention either common schools. They might mention, um, they might they might say, uh, you know, schools for the public good, something really broad like this, right? Mm-hmm. Provide for public education, that sort of thing. Kentucky, Kentucky's constitution is pretty different, though. And, you know, part of it is because Kentucky law is, is more similar to French law than it is uh, British law. And so mm-hmm. Kentucky and Louisiana are different um, in, in that regard from every other state in the union. So Kentucky really itemizes things within its constitution. And uh, forgive me for kind of nerding out on state constitutional provisions really quick. Mm-hmm. But, um, but what, makes, what makes Kentucky's uh, constitution really unique with regards to education is that it says uh, very specifically that no uh, no dollars, no sum shall be raised or collected for education other than in those common schools. Okay, right. So um, it, it also says that no portion of any fund um, can be raised or levied for um, uh, in aid of or used by any church, sectarian, or denominational school. Right. So mm-hmm. religious, religiously affiliated schools. That's really unique because Kentucky. What I would say is most states uh, in their constitution, you can think of their constitutional educational provisions as kind of a floor. Here's what the state has, you know, must do. At a base, lo- base level, it must do this. And then, you know, states routinely go above that, right? Um, think about uh, college scholarship funds and things like that at the state level. Mm-hmm. Uh, that Those are not in constitutions, but you can go above that. Kentucky's constitution, I would say, sets a floor and sets a ceiling. It's sort of a, and there's not much difference between those two levels because it sort of says, here's what you have to do. And oh, by the way, you you actually can't do more than that, mm-hmm. right? And so that's pretty different. So the ballot that you, uh, or the this ballot initiative that's gonna be on the ballot in Kentucky in uh, November of this year, 2024, it would um, uh, give parents, uh, it, it would basically ask Kentucky voters, um, are you in favor of giving parents the um, educational opportunities that are outside the system of common public schools by amending the constitution? And so it would amend those sections so that, so it would basically um, raise that ceiling, if you will. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that has in Kentucky, and again, uh, there's some of these dynamics at play in different States in different ways for the, some of the reasons that you mentioned, the the I think it was a few years ago that it was passed that uh, allowed for charter schools, but there was no funding. And I think that obviously is a big stumbling block to have more, uh, I suppose, charter school. I think it's 
charter schools is the exact is the right language um and i know charters yeah. can be public or private depending in states and those kinds of things and those are important distinctions and i remember actually it was uh, held it was a live hearing with the kentucky supreme court here in my hometown which is just outside of louisville and they did a hearing on you know the viability of i think it was the the school vouchers program and i remember listening and thinking there's they're, they're going to deny that because of some of the things that you mentioned i think you know the 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 i guess lack of limiting principle or ways in which the funds might be spent or mm-hmm. uh, spent in you know sort of religious schools and uh, personally i think that that's a real problem like i i i I am an advocate of school choice. I actually exercise school choice in public. So my daughters go to a, a neighboring county public school. Mm-hmm. And so I think that that's really important. But I also think it's really important to maintain some of those clear clear lines of distinction between public and private money and those kinds of things with religious schools and that kind of nature. And I know there are some, and I'm, I'm sure you can cite them, some ways in which, you know, public money gets spent in religious venues and spaces. And, you know, that is certainly true. And to the extent that that's true, it's maybe problematic. But I'm curious, because it seems like this is uh, in some ways a bit of a, a way to end run or override that sort of exemption, right? Well, w- what I would say is the Kentucky Constitution um, is, uh, I mean, it is what it is, right? And mm-hmm. so I think that it's a, I, I think this seems to be particularly based on how courts, uh, the Kentucky Supreme Court ruled um, uh, against the uh, charter schools. Mm-hmm. Um, this is sort of the viable option. So if if lawmakers in Kentucky and parents um, in Kentucky are really looking to implement um, options, educational options beyond that common system. Mm-hmm. It, it seems to me that amending the constitution is sort of the option. And I, you know, I view the amending the constitution. I mean, that's a pretty serious thing, right? And in any state or mm-hmm. whether it was a, the U S constitution. And so I, I do think that's a, it's a serious thing to do, but, um, but we also bake that, uh, option into our democratic process because mm-hmm. things change over time. And so I think it's something that, yeah, folks need to take seriously for sure. Um, but it's not, I wouldn't call it a, it's not like a mere procedural thing, right? Mm-hmm. This is, um, there's going to be, I know a lot of messaging about this. There's going to be lots of debates, I'm sure. And particularly in a, a year like this, because I believe Kentucky doesn't have um, like statewide elections on the ballot this year. Um, like no governor, no gubernatorial election. I mean, it'll be a presidential, obviously. Not go- not but, governor, but there should be there be state representatives and things like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So so this will this will be, I would say, a pretty pretty big thing on the on the ballot, and because it's a presidential year, I would guess a lot of people will come out and vote also. Mm-hmm. So I do think you're going to get um, a a great sort of not not even just a sample, right? You're going to probably have some pretty significant representation to see what what voters um, support, yeah. Yeah, well, so where does AFC kind of stand on that that issue that I think is really, you know, pretty prescient for lots of people, whether they're advocates for or not for school choice, is that spending of money and being, being able to allocate it towards, you know, schools that might be religiously based? Yeah, so we really think of the dollars following students. Right. And I think that um, despite, <laughs> yeah, one way to think about it is if you think about um, really any state constitution, the purpose of educational provisions in state constitutions isn't to buy bricks. It's not to purchase um, educational materials. It's actually to have an educated citizenry, right? To have um, people who are, are conversant can, um, can, can, you know, work with one another can balance different ideas and nuanced ideas and sort of drive our society um, into the, into the future. That is inherently people centric. I think when you, when folks think about, well, but these dollars are going to a, let's say a Catholic school, or these dollars are going to a, um, you know, a a Jewish school. Um, I think that, that's the wrong frame 
because I think that the right frame is really thinking about it from an individual standpoint. So for instance, we don't really think about um, uh, healthcare subsidies as funding, say, uh, uh, a private hospital, right? We think about the healthcare subsidy. So if you take something like Medicare or Medicaid, mm -hmm. right? Or uh, Kentucky probably has a, has a Medicaid type program. I know Tennessee does. So in Tennessee, if someone, um, if a low income family uses 10 care, it's what we call it, 10 care dollars, and they um, uh, go seek care at St. Thomas Hospital. We don't say, we, nobody raises their hands and, and says, and like hair is on fire and says, oh my goodness, um, we're spending public dollars to enrich, you know, Catholic, private Catholic hospitals. Mm hmm Right, we say no. We're this person is spending money to get health care that they need um, at a place where they're comfortable. And they pick uh, St. Thomas. They could have gone to Vanderbilt, which is technically a nonprofit, but by the way, has like a you know multi billion dollar endowment. So there's <laughs> nothing to nothing sacrosanct about being a nonprofit. They could have gone there. They could have gone to Metro General. Why they pick St. Thomas? I don't know. It's probably the closest one. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so. I think in the school uh, in the school context, it's really similar. We think, all right, how does a parent decide? How do we empower parents to make a decision that matches kind of their their characteristics um, and their values? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and I think that that is one of those ty kinds of exceptions, right? I mean, I I have an appointment, had an appointment Saturday, or I'm sorry, uh, Tuesday with a physical therapist with the Baptist Medical Health Group, right? It's, uh, right. and it's, and it's, it is interesting to, because we don't, I don't think many people, myself included, really think about it. Oh, like, oh, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to a church hospital kind of thing, right? That's not what I think. Right. That's it's right. just a, it's just sort of a name. Uh, but so let me play devil's advocate here though, because. And, and, and uh, by the way, our St. Thomas hospital used to be Baptist hospital. So yeah, take what you want. From <laughs> there that. you go. Yeah. 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 Or, or, you know, there's also, I think, uh, Jewish, uh, I, I don't remember the name of it, but you know, the point remains that there's yep. numbers of these kinds of organizations that are obviously, well, I mean, maybe not so obviously, but uh, anyways, um, don't want to get bogged down in that discussion. So the let me play devil's advocate here for a moment, because when you say, you know, providing students for great options and, you know, I hear that argument and it resonates with me in some ways. And, and I've made this argument in some ways in some places of like money following the students versus, you know, an institution or something like that. And yep. we can talk about that distinction and, and how to think about that here in a moment. But when we think about great options, one of my pushbacks on school choice is that we want to make sure that there are great options and that just more options doesn't mean they're great. And so following that line, thinking about the sort of religious nature, and there are other ways in which this might manifest and be a problem as well, but religion can be an easy one to sort of pick on, especially because we, we, we you know, think about the separation of church and state. You know, like, so for example, here in the, in Kentucky, we have, I think it's called the Ark Encounter. Um, you know, there's a Noah's Ark and, you know, they think dinosaurs were fake or not real and, you know, the earth is 6,000 years old or some things like that, right? And so ostensibly, one might argue and say, well, we're opening up money to potentially start schools where students are actually not learning actual real facts, right? Mm -hmm. They're learning things that are factually incorrect. And we want an informed citizenry. I think that, you know, that's the, the language you use, and I agree, right? But therein lies a problem. And so how do we avoid that problem? Or maybe we shouldn't. You know, there's a, a an argument there of paternalism and say, well, parents know best. And uh, yeah. I'm yeah. not sure if I 100% agree with that, but I, I understand the sentiment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the reality is that lots of times when, uh, well, I don't think it's necessarily a majority. I mean, this is, this is not scientific. This is not a scientific poll. But I think often when people say, um, when people think about parents, they think, well, they think about themselves and they think, well, um, as long as everybody is making the decision that I'm making, then I trust parents. 
that that is one way i think the improper way to think about it um right we can sometimes be skeptic skeptical unfortunately of our neighbors but i think this is part of the tension of living in a pluralistic um society right that i think about the the block where i live um we've got people uh who are devoutly religious we've got people who seem to care nothing about religion we've got people you know probably in the big in the big middle mm-hmm. um all the religions aren't the same. I mean, I'm in I'm in Nashville. It's sort of the the uh, the buckle of the Bible Belt. Mm-hmm. But we've got. Um, I mean, I I have met with a group of um, of families who are very very interested in starting um, a a school for their non Christian faith. Right, they're uh, 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 immigrants and refugees, and they've come mostly from the Middle East, and they say. Hey, we've been in this community actually for 25 years, um, and it's really hard for our kids to honor uh, their commitment to prayer during the day in public schools. It's really hard to do that. And I go, oh, yeah, that actually, that I understand how that could be a logistical challenge, right? Mm-hmm. And so they're interested in going, okay, how do we how do we inculcate our kids? with the values that are really important to us. So this is just part of the tension of a pluralist uh, society where we've just got different values in tension. And so I guess one of the things that I'd say, you know, to your question about like, how do we make sure that kids are are learning or or maybe not learning things that we don't agree with? Mm -hmm. The reality is, um, there's, I believe there's no such thing as value neutral education. Um, meaning you can go to a, a, the zone public school down the street, but are, are there values being communicated? Yeah, there are values being communicated, right? The fact that we have, um, that, that if you come after a certain point, a certain time in the day, you will be marked late. That is a value. Mm -hmm. Um, the fact that if you, uh, in the, in the lunchroom, take your neighbor's snack, that's what we're communicating values. We're communicating ways in which we think civil society should work. Mm-hmm. Um, now, <laughs> some of those values may may um, start to touch on um, religion and some of those, you know, as we've seen now, lots of school districts have wildly different opinions about what what books and what curricula mm-hmm. are mm-hmm. Um, are are appropriate. Those are values based decisions. Mm-hmm. And so one of the risks, I would say, of having um, few or no options is that the values of the prevailing, say, school board are now what you have for the entire county or the entire city, mm-hmm. right? So that's actually a risk if you don't have any school choice. So, so I'm with you. There's nothing, um, uh, there's nothing that guarantees that every option, when you have lots of options, is going to be great. There's nothing that guarantees that. Mm-hmm. But if you, if the only option you have are the options put forth by your local school board, then then you certainly know that there's not going to be a bunch of var- there's not going to be variability, mm-hmm. right? And so if that school board decides um, that, just taking your example, that the curriculum it chooses um, denies the existence of bacteria. Just making something up. I've never, I've never heard any any science book say it's that. It's probably but, out there, <laughs> and I'm sure it's out there, right? Let's say somebody denies the existence of bacteria. If the school board, which is often like nine people <laughs> or something, seven people, sure. that that were each voted on by a few hundred folks, so this is not many people, right? Um, if they decide that that's a great curriculum, well, guess what? Every every kid for the next four years or until that school board turns over is learning that they that we live in a world with no bacteria, right? And what are the options there? And so I would say that's actually a, a um, that's a, a pretty negative effect on our kids. Yeah. Um, so I think, uh, and again, to continue some devil's advocacy, here, yeah, yeah. Um, I think we want to make some distinctions between values and what is accepted truth and knowledge. And, and that, I think, is really important. One of the things we advocate for when we work with schools on is that understanding of, of really leaning into what Enlightenment liberalism helps us 
figure out which is what is true, and that's the the sort of checking process and epistemology and those kinds of things, which is a really big problem, right? Uh, you use bacteria, but I can come up. I mean, one might say that the the example I gave is you know on the right, and maybe it is, maybe it's not. It's probably more on the right, conservative Christian, that kind of thing. But I can give you an example on the left, you know, people saying, well, biological men and women are the same, or, you know, trans women and trans men are the same as biological men and women. And as we understand it right now, that is not true. That is not something that is scientifically true. But there might be schools who might teach that or teachers that might teach that, which is a whole different issue because you're talking about, you know, rogue actors or things like that. But you're talking about a board or a school that might decide to say, well, this is what we're going to teach. This is our, this is what we believe to be true. Right. And in fact, you know, the scientific evidence and empirical checking doesn't back that up, nor would it uh, check, you know, back up, you know, that there were no dinosaurs and the earth is 6,000 years old. So that is to me one of the, the, the fundamental problems of the school choice movement insofar as like we, how do we put in place guardrails or, or steps and protocols or whatever it might be to ensure that there is some, you know, sort of common denominator of quality and outcomes and those kinds of things. I I had that a conversation and Corey DeAngelis is part of the organization. Uh, mm-hmm. I had him on the podcast many years ago and, you know, that was my push then. It was like, how do you, how do we make sure that because there should be, in my estimation, and maybe this is paternalistic, but but there should be some guidance from our leadership, whether it's at the state level or the federal level or both or some version of that, that says, yes, yeah, school choice, and there's lots of different ways in which we might that might manifest it. But here are some common denominators that all mm-hmm. must have for mm-hmm. them to be viable options. Yeah, yeah, and and if I mean, I want to, I want to. Um, Definitely tread lightly, but I don't want to. Um, but that doesn't mean to obfuscate. Meaning, um, I think this is just a, a complex thing, mm-hmm. right? We're talking about you know fifty, sixty million school age kids and mm-hmm. um, and what they're going to learn. So there's a lot of um, diversity there um, in in in, a, in opinions uh, among their families, in their communities, and in, in their um, in how those children learn, et cetera. Um, okay, so I we do think at ASC we do think that quality matters. So if I if we go back to my example with healthcare, mm-hmm. um, we don't expect. In fact, we know that when people come into the hospital, they are coming with years of different experiences um, that lead to whatever their whatever their health manifestations are, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe somebody is a, somebody was a smoker. Somebody um, was an athlete. Somebody was an athlete and a smoker, right? I mean, there's all sorts of different things, genetic things, and all sorts of stuff. Okay, great. We expect that when they leave the care of a physician, that they are certainly no worse off than they were when than when they started, right? Mm-hmm. That's sort of an expectation. Mm-hmm. Um, I kind of I have that expectation of schools. Right. Let's not let's make sure that kids are not worse off. And if you look at things like the National Assessment of Educational Progress, the NAEP, which I know your listeners are familiar with, mm-hmm. unfortunately, for a lot of kids, I'm thinking about like um, sort of the African American subgroup. Um, you've got more kids who are proficient in fourth grade, and then it the number decreases by eighth grade, and then further decreases by twelfth grade. Why why is it that? Um, the longer at least african-american kids stay in the system the less proficient they are the worse they are right that i would say that's a that's a bad outcome Mm -hmm. um it's not what we should expect um i think it's an embarrassment in a country with this got such uh material wealth and um we can do better i'm sure that but i also think that there are some things um sort of baked into most of our public school systems that make it really difficult for teachers to innovate, for leaders to make the calls that they need, that they know would benefit their single school. But we've got a whole lot of inertia built into our system. And I think it's, for the most part, the public school system uh, lacks 
real accountability. And what I mean by real accountability is not test-based accountability. I mean, I, I'm actually, again, and this is, this is Shaka Mitchell dad. We're pretty good with tests. My, my girls, um, we've tried to sort of demystify tests a little bit and we say, Hey, okay, we're going to take a test. Next week is, is a test week. Fine. Your ultimate value and self-worth is not, you know, doesn't come down to your map assessment. Right. Um, so, you know, my kids talk about test scores and how they did and whatever, whatever, not a big deal. Um, I get that not every family is like that, but to me, real accountability is when a parent can sit down with a school administrator and I've had this happen and they can say, Hey, Mr. Mitchell, Mr. Perkins, this situation is just not working for us. We're out, right? Either it changes or we're out. Mm -hmm. And right now I would just say that's, that's something that absent school choice is really lacking in the public school system. Um, there's just not that ability. Most families don't have the ability to say, Hey, this is just not working. Maybe because the quality is not great, what have you, because they don't have any other options. And so they can feel stuck. And so that's why I think there's a, there's definitely a, a net benefit when there's that kind of parental accountability. Yeah. Um, and I am in some ways sympathetic to the sort of idea of competition and that, that element driving some improvement. Um, it's still, I think overlooks and, and again, my, my biggest concern and frustration with the, uh, with actually education in general, but also the school choice movement, as I, it, it, most of what I hear and see is that like, yes, more choices are better and will drive improvement. And that may or may not be true. I think there's some evidence that we certainly see schools opening and closing. I just saw one recently that opened and closed and it was a apparently a really terrible school, some sort of great mm -hmm. idea that didn't work well. And people mm -hmm. are like, well, see, this this is a, a, an example of accountability. And it is, but it also is an example of, of kids engaging in something that was really poor. And then you've got the churn and you've also True. got- Disruption. Yeah, Disruptive. Yep. yeah. Uh, and the money that while I'm while I'm sympathetic to the idea that it, that it follows should follow the kids, um, it also if I'm trying to run a school, money is one of those things that is helpful. And not having funding certainly can make it harder to improve. Lots of other things at play as well. Mm -hmm. um, and even with all that money, it's still really hard to improve schools and and some more than others because of local and other extraneous external factors and things like that. But yeah, I, I mean, it just, uh, it really strikes me as perhaps an unsolvable problem. I mean, it's, it maybe is not the, the, the job of AFC or school choice organizations to insist that we have some sort of common denominator for quality. But, you know, I, I can imagine that if we had better leadership around that, uh, again, maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's too paternalistic. Maybe we shouldn't be doing that. But it it doesn't strike me as it strikes me as a far from perfect sol solution or way to improve schools, whether they're public, private, charter, or not. To not have a sort of a common denominator of yeah, some leadership to say here's quality, quality yeah. teaching and learning, and here yeah. are the things that we that we need to be focusing on, and then there's a, a whole range of things yeah. that might be choices and variables. Yeah, I did. I mean, one thing that I, I want to mention, I, I had a conversation with a friend of mine, dear friend of mine, um, who's a professor at a, a university. He he teaches other. Um, soon to be teachers mm -hmm. right in the college of education there and um and he's great and he was asking me he he said hey you know uh and he was sort of you know putting really good questions to me and he said hey one of the things i just want to know about um school choice is um why why not just take the why not take the same test as the public schools and i said okay it's a it's a good question but what he didn't realize because he spent most of his career, in fact, he spent all of his career um, at in in the public school system, um, except for the time when he actually got his mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, master's and PhD, which was at a private university. Um, but he didn't really realize what I told him, which is, hey, um, 
most, and by most, I mean 95 plus percent, probably 99 percent of private schools take standardized tests, right? He, he thought it was just like, come as you are, you know, we're given, we're, uh, we take tuition and give you a high five and call it good, right? He just mm -hmm. didn't have that, um, that experience. And I said, hey, in fact, not only do most of them take standardized tests, most of them take nationally norm reference tests, which, mm -hmm. by the way, a lot of states, as you know, Drew, are still taking tests that are not nationally norm referenced in a world that's now has global competition, right? So we're, you know, some states are, are busy saying, here's how you, here's how you, um, stack up to a kid two counties away, but you're going to be competing with kids from, you know, Iowa and Massachusetts and Florida and, mm -hmm. and Mumbai, right? And so th that was one of the things he didn't realize. So I would, I would caution folks to um, appreciate that even in the private school system and certainly in the charter school system, there is that sort of at least test-based, um, you know, metrics happening. Now, I'll also say, and a lot of people don't realize this, but if you look at the school choice legislation um, around the country, so we've got, let's see, some just passed in um, Georgia, uh, Wyoming, uh, I think here in the next few weeks, maybe by the time this podcast is, is published in Tennessee, mm -hmm. um, most of these programs, the vast majority of them, actually have a uh, testing element to mm -hmm. them. And so the one in, in Tennessee will will have a testing element and, and private schools can do one of two things. They can, if they've already um, have a nationally norm, norm reference test that they're giving, they can use that and submit some, you know, the, the data, there's some data transparency measures, mm -hmm. but they can also opt to um, use the state assessment. And at AFC, we actually think that that's a, that's a helpful thing. It's not perfect, um, but we do think one of the things that will help parents, like if you're going to give parents choices, then you should also give them data, right? And they should have some, there should be some data transparency um, so that they can see, okay, well, I don't want to just go based off somebody's, you know, uh, reputation. Mm -hmm. Show me the receipts. And so we do think that that's important. Again, not perfect because it's a complex problem as you identify, but it's, um, we do think there's some things that you can do and you can put it into the laws, into the legislation um, to help with that. Yeah. Well, again, the, the, the quality is definitely something that, as a, you know, obviously I've, I've uh, stated, is, is a real concern of mine. One of the, the examples that I can cite, and you may be, may be aware, well aware of them, we just uh, released a podcast where I had a discussion about reading instruction. And there's a group, parent advocacy group in Nashville called Nashville Propel. Mm -hmm. And one of the big things that they are really concerned about is reading instruction yeah. and really making sure that we're focusing reading instruction through the lens of phonics and science of reading and, and those those principles, which is, I think, another example of, you know, would we, are we okay uh, with our school choices being allowed to say, well, we want to do balanced literacy and three queuing, which is now being outlawed right. in some states right. and those kinds of things. And as I've talked about and talked with people about the, the sort of reading wars, it's certainly politicized. Interestingly enough, though, Emily Hanford is, and she was on a podcast with a panel, you know, several years ago and her big sold a story podcast we talked about this it's like she's coming from american public media uh, which is certainly not right-leaning but science of reading stuff tends to be a bit more um politicized to the right i think but it's mm -hmm. a weird mm -hmm. it's a weird mixture yeah it is um i'm curious uh just given that context and, and anything you know about that but like the the we, you know, I, I presented some challenges and some things that I think are, are really difficult challenges to overcome. But one of those are the people and groups that oppose school choice. And as I understand it, you clear you clarified this as much as you can. You know, teachers unions, NEA, those kinds of groups are pretty staunchly in opposition. And uh, I guess maybe unpack how you think about those larger groups and their opposition and what they get wrong and maybe what they get right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. Can I make a, a quick comment about the science of reading? Sure, stuff? sure. Because that definitely hits home. Um, I mean, 
uh, 20 fall of 2020, we had a, um, a kindergartner mm -hmm. in my house. And mm -hmm. so, um, we had a kindergartner who was then at home and doing virtual stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and we saw significant, significant, um, reading delays as mm -hmm. compared to her two older sisters. Mm -hmm. Um, we're at, we have a house. I mean, I'm we're we're blessed to say we've got a house with lots of books, lots of opportunities to read. We're reading, you know. There's no lack of that. And I would say because of the the queuing uh, that was happening once school restarted, mm -hmm. it was very clear that uh, my youngest was mostly guessing. Right. So when I heard Emily, you know, uh, Hansford's uh, stuff, it mm -hmm. was like I went, "Oh boy, yeah, this is like I know this story actually." And I was in a um, you know, watching her give a presentation at a meeting, and I thought, "Oh, I know the story." So, one of the interesting things. So, my my kids then were were at a um, at a public charter school, and they were following very much the. Um, I mean, they had the the their own, um, say, scope and sequence uh, throughout the year, but they would have had the same uh, standards of the state schools, right? Mm -hmm. And so they're angling towards those um, using, I would say, some faulty methods. And um, we really saw things get a lot better when we moved that daughter to a private school. Now, we were able to do that because we were able to afford it. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of people aren't. And so one of the things, and so, yeah, I mean, you say that reading, kind of the reading wars, what have you, this has been, it's made for interesting maybe bedfellows. Mm -hmm. um, but... Private schools were the ones not doing the three queuing, um, by and large. Because again, what happened is you had this stuff coming out of colleges of education. Mm -hmm. It's then infiltrated into state departments of education, pushed down to everybody statewide, and then you end up with a million kids coming through the system, all quote learning to read, but really like guessing and looking around the page at pictures. Mm -hmm. Um, and so now the harm is just at the scale that is going to take us years to undo mm -hmm. versus at many of the private schools where, where parents just go, Hey, this doesn't seem quite right. Teacher, you know, this just doesn't, maybe it's not how I learned it. Right. That's how Emily came to it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not how I remember learning to read, but this just doesn't seem quite right. And in that setting, I just think these settings are often, not always, but often more responsive, right? Because something that you don't hear in um, in choice schools, for the most part, is you don't hear them say, well, that's a, those are our standards. There's nothing I can do about it. Mm -hmm. It's just a different, it's a different ethos. Um, and that's hard to, sometimes it's, it's hard to quantify, um, but we definitely saw it there. Um, does that, does that make sense? Yeah, well, so I think that's a, maybe a really actually a good example of where, where so you, on one hand you say, well, if we have choice, then we can make the choice to go somewhere else. And you exercise that choice with, yep. you know, you have the resources yep. to do that. And the argument is that everybody should have those resources, right? One of the things that I, that I think is... There, there's some version of this. I, I, I understand there's some pushback uh, that, that's reasonable, Like, but people say, well, competition drives better performance, and, and I agree in most cases, right? In the marketplace, if a restaurant or a grocery store isn't performing and doing well, then competition opens up, and the, they either perform better or they go out of business, right? Uh, but that's not a, what I would say is something like a public good, and, and I've, I've seen arguments saying, well, school is not a public good, and Okay, um, but we if we say we we certainly want all of our students to be good readers, and not having the numbers of people being able to read is detrimental to our society and our culture and our economy in all kinds of ways, and that's mm -hmm. that's a point that's made by Emily Hanford. Then we really should make sure that all of our schools are doing that quality right mm -hmm. and so giving the opportunity for schools to open and be like well we're not doing phonics we're doing three queuing it seems like 
<laughs> you know, an argument of, of, yeah, we got competition, but we have really bad options. And, you know, again, mm-hmm. uh, I would say, well, how do we make sure that those common denominator things are in place? Because good reading instruction seems like it would be one of those. Yeah, I, I definitely, I definitely hear you. I think, I think maybe it's just a matter of, um, uh, I think what you're doing respectfully is anticipating what anticipating a negative that could happen, Hmm. right? Anticipating a school that could open and might, might willfully decide to use methods that are not helpful, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe even harmful. Mm -hmm. And that, and that could happen. Oh, I think it does happen though. Well, what I was going to say, what definitely does happen is you have entire school districts Mm -hmm. where the wrong method is already entrenched. Sure. and, And where, to change it it takes i mean you've probably watched some school board meetings you can change what happens at a at a local when my kids were in a montessori school they can change practices in a week mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. if they if they think something is not working right um tr- trying to get the metro nashville right. public schools and this and natural propel knows this trying to get the metro nashville public school board to change something right i mean goodness gracious it, it took them two years to change the name of a school right Right. And so that, so that's where I sort of think it's like, um, taking the, taking the, the world as it is, which is far from perfect. Um, I mean, I I sort of think, boy, we got to do better. And so, so, so I definitely hear you on, um, could you have, could you have, uh, bad actors? Certainly in any situation you could, but I think, um, we've got a situation that is i think as covid revealed far more dire for a, a really great number of students than people realized and and it just continues to to like mm-hmm. roll on <laughs> and unfortunately it's like our kids are on this train and the train is like headed for a cliff or something i don't know what's going to happen for all the kids who learned 3 q you know learned i don't know if that's even the right way to say it but mm-hmm. who utilize that method i mean what in the world is going to happen, you know, for, for students, um, when they're trying to get jobs in 15 years, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, now you asked a question about, um, kind of opponents of school choice and, right, right. um, you know, hard for me. I don't want to, I don't want to speak too much for, for them because I'm clearly not an opponent of school choice. So I don't want to, um, I can't, I can't fully get in their heads, but I think there are a lot of folks who, um, who really just hold on to um, a nostalgia for public schools, right? I hear I hear this phrase, or some version of this phrase a lot. Public schools are the bedrock of our democracy. Mm-hmm. Well, no, they're not. I'm a lawyer and a political scientist, and I, I, they're not the bedrock of of our democracy, and they never were. Um, we didn't even have public schools at the start of the, you know, at the inception of our country. Um, it, it, so I think, but I think that there's a nostalgia, right? If you talk to a lot of people, if you talk to 19 year olds, oh man, their, their school experience was awful, right? And they were, they're glad to be done with it, their K-12 experience. Mm-hmm. By the time they turn 50, oh, it's so nostalgic. Oh boy, they had, you know, the best friendships of their lives. And now, now is some of that wisdom that comes over time, perhaps, um, but I do think that there's, sometimes an unearned nostalgia and um, and that combines with a reluctance just to change and to innovate, right? This is the system as we've known it. Like, wouldn't it be really easy if we can just move to a neighborhood and the school that's closest to us just works and we don't have to make any other decisions? Well, yeah, that would be super easy. I would love to um, not sit in Nashville traffic um, to, to get my girls to school in a, in a different zone, whatever. Mm-hmm. But, that is just unfortunately not the case for a lot of people. Um, But I think that a lot of opponents of school choice sort of kind of, you know, pine for those days again and where we go like, oh, well, just the neighborhood schools. But, you know, one of the interesting things, and I haven't seen this this data re-upped in a little while, but um, public school teachers utilize school choice um, at disproportionately higher rates than the public. Right. Meaning public, the kids of public school teachers 
um, go to out of zone schools, hmm. right? More than the rest of the, I think that's really important. I respect teachers a lot. And if teachers, the ones who are like at the point of sale are, are utilizing school choice, I kind of go, yeah, maybe other people <laughs> should have a crack at this too. So I, I actually often think that um, you see a lot of the opposition is from, um, say, teachers union leaders and administrators and not rank and file teachers, which is why, I mean, who's teaching in private schools? Lots of times, it's, it's most times, it's teachers who were in the public school system, right? They wanted some different experiences. They wanted different, maybe different autonomy, maybe different work-life balance, whatever, um, often for less pay. And so I don't, I actually don't think it's a, a teacher thing. I think it's a teacher union thing, which is why when you look at a whole lot of, uh, maybe not so much in Kentucky, Kentucky's got a really, Kentucky has had a really vibrant um, teacher's sort of movement for a long time. Um, some other states have too. But you look at teachers' union activism in my state, and it's very clearly teachers who have not been in a classroom in 20 years, right? It's not folks. It's not people who are in classrooms on a daily basis with students. It's folks who have worked for the back office for a long time. So, so thinking about like the NEA and Randy Weingarten, who, uh, you know, if you're paying attention at all, people would know that name. And uh, there's, there's similar people at the state levels, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. There are in Louisville, uh, Kentucky, the JCTA, Brent McKim is, um, you know, I have some real questions about JCTA. Uh, those kinds of political actors and you know we we everything is political now and everything is partisan everything is us versus them and I wonder how you all think about that and how you might navigate that in a way that's more productive because you know I I, I hear people say, well, you know, the Democratic Party and all these big donors are behind the NEA and all these other people and blah, 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 you know, it's dark money and, you know, nefarious forces and that kind of thing, right? Uh, and I'm sure some of it is true. I also hear, uh, you know, like I was, I had Laura Papano who wrote a book about school moms, which is essentially about um, moms for liberty, that kind of activism and that kind of stuff. And, you know, there's the assertion that on the right, there are, these forces at work, big money, dark money that really want to just destroy public education. And that may, I, I don't know, I like, I don't think about that very often and maybe I should think about it more, but there's no doubt that there's big money behind these movements and there's no doubt that there's partisanship, there's political, there's, there's all of these forces at play. And then on top of it, we have these people like uh, Tiffany Justice, Moms for Liberty, uh, Randy Weingarten, you know, you can name the people. Um, in some ways, I would say uh, Corey DeAngelis is a bit, I mean, he is, uh, he's very uh, polarizing. Spicy. And, yeah. Um, I, I don't, I don't have a whole lot of appreciation for the way that he sort of attacks the, the issue, I guess, is, is maybe a kind way to say it. And it feels to me like, how do we, how, how can we navigate this and actually think about getting to an ideal? Because if we say that we think public education is important, and I think it is, uh, whether it's a technically a bedrock of, of democracy or not, we certainly want to have a, an educated citizenry, uh, well-educated, thoughtful, smart, um, all of those, reading, numeracy, those kinds of things. And without the opportunity to get education for free, which would be public, uh, then we've got additional problems cascading, all those kinds of things. So, I, I mean, I guess I've, I've thrown a whole lot at you there. Uh, feel free to respond to what you would like and maybe ignore some of it because uh, <laughs> be friendly fire. Yeah, well, I, I think that, um, I think that, listen, all of us in the advocacy world um, have at some point been so frustrated with, the other side or maybe even maybe even folks on our side that we just you know you want to like slam your your computer down and mm -hmm. have one of those uh, if you remember the movie office space have one of those office mm -hmm. space moments where you're just you know <laughs> uh, destroying the printer and because uh, you're you're so fed up and i think particularly in education um 
when we're talking about children, when we're talking about our own children and thinking about like, how is this going to play out? Um, you know, you talk about, yeah, you talk, some of the folks that you've had on your show, whether they're advocacy groups, whatever, like I've, I've sat with before mm -hmm. and as well. And these are real people. And so I, so I'll speak for myself. Um, I think that it is, if you really care about the well-being, the educational well-being of children, which I think leads to, by the way, the overall well-being of of children and and humanity and kind mm -hmm. of civil society, um, then I think you have to be willing to um, not you just completely denigrate the other side, um, and also appreciate like, hey, what can we learn from from mm -hmm. other folks, right? So, so for instance, I don't when I hear that. Um, when I hear that a teacher's union is really concerned with teachers' work-life balance, mm -hmm. my, my first thought isn't, oh, those lazy teachers, right? My first thought is, yeah, work-life balance does seem pretty crazy for teachers. And like, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I worked in schools, but I think like, yeah, what other professions are, is it so challenging to go to a dentist appointment? Mm -hmm. right because you don't have time off in the middle right, of the day right. and and it's so disruptive and whatever um and so yeah i i i think there's a way to hear some of the thing some of those things some of those concerns that are by the way adult centric mm -hmm. um and respond to them thoughtfully now i think that where frankly we have to sort of call a spade a spade is when you have uh, teachers unions uh, associations calling for things that have very little to do with the educational well-being of children so for instance um, I remember uh, this was must have been 2020 when schools were closed and you know obviously it's a disruptive time but I remember when you had teachers unions I think it was the Oakland school district um, or Oakland uh, California you know mm -hmm. association um, was was basically saying we don't want to return to work until the United States rejoins the Paris Climate Accords. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like what? What are we talking about? Right, right. That's that's bananas, right? And so that's that's where I think that you know certainly folks on um, who are supporters of school choice often get like so frustrated that it makes it really hard to have conversations sometimes, right? If I want to, I mean, you and I. Are having a conversation about how do we ensure quality in schools if all of a sudden you start saying well we can't we definitely can't ensure quality in schools until we you know until we make sure that the u.s joins the u.n declaration of human rights i'm like wait what what do we that's not what we're talking about that's not what we're here to talk about right, right. so i think sometimes um i understand the frustration um i like i said i mean i think you can't have lots of schools without lots of great teachers so I, I think that's really important, but I I think that often union administrators are just way out of step with their, um, you know, with their membership, um, as evidenced I think by lots of times when when teachers find out how much say they're paying in union dues in states, and this is happening less and less now, but in states where that was just a guaranteed sort of thing, it automatically came out of your paycheck. Like, don't th that feels like um, pretty. Um, pretty nefarious. You're the same people telling me that I should get paid more um, have made it impossible for me to keep my whole paycheck. Um, that doesn't seem that doesn't seem right. And so I think that that's a it just shows a misalignment. Again, that's not an issue that AFC is going to take on. Mm -hmm. That's a y'all can fight about that in inside the family, but it it evidences a misalignment where sometimes we're not um, you're not talking about what's best for the children. Mm. Yeah, well, it just seems to me that there's so much of what we're engaging in, whether it's on school choice or reading wars or you know, 
politics and part. It's it's just us versus them, and yeah. so many players are tr- essentially. It feels like they're just trying to win, and what they how they define win, it can be different, but oftentimes that win isn't necessarily related to, in this case, the quality of education for kids. They mm-hmm. can couch it in that, mm-hmm. um, and, and you, you can couch it on, on the school choice side, and you can couch it on the, the sort of the other side, the, you know, we got to keep schools closed because it's not safe for kids. Well, actually, evidence shows it was safe for kids, and we should be right. opening schools, and right. the detrimental harms are long-lasting, and that is now pretty clear. And I was yelled at and called a moral monster for asking questions whether my kids should wear masks to schools and things like that. Um, but on the other hand, you know, the other side is like, you know, public public schools are failing, and there's a message, and there's just this win, win, win. Uh, that's one of the things I I, yeah. I get frustrated with Corey about. It's like, you know let's have some nuance and some complexity in this conversation and not just be about winning, winning every battle, right? It's just a war. It's a war. It's a war. And Mm -hmm. school choice is just another one of those things. That's just a, it just feels like a war and it's just increasingly hard to have a, an actual conversation, you know, like this, uh, which I appreciate, you know, we're, we're not at war. Um, yeah. we, we actually have yeah. lots of things uh, that we agree about and um, very sympathetic to us. Like, how do we move that forward uh, productively? When I talked with Sonia Thomas of Nashville Propel and she said, I said, you know, how do you navigate this stuff? She says, I don't pay attention to it. I don't care. Yeah. I, want, I want kids to read, right? Yeah. You can, you can have your camp, your battles, your whatever. I'm going to try to get kids to read. Yeah. Well, and, and in a similar fashion, I mean, I think um, I I am not, as the kids say, I'm not very online. Mm. Um, <laughs> I, I'm online enough, <laughs> right? In part because in both my um, in both my online, uh, I, I don't I don't want to say persona. I don't even know that I have a persona up <laughs> um but in in my online like activity it's really activity mm-hmm. in my online activity but also i think in the way that i conduct myself in conversations like this but even in conversations with people who really because like you and i really i think there's a lot of alignment actually sure, sure. but um in conversations with people who don't um necessarily you know who we don't see eye to eye i'm i'm trying to model behavior for my own children right Right. So I don't want my kids to be so very online. So I've got to be, um, I've got to make a, a point to at the dinner table, not have my phone. Right. And to, to sort of put it away and go, okay, I'm not going to do this. So then when I can say to my, I have some credibility when I say to my 13 year old, Hey, let's put our phones away. It's dinner time. Right. I think in a, in a similar fashion, um, I think it's important to model that in our public discourse. And so I don't have a, problem and i'm it's not only that i don't have a problem it's that to me the honest thing for me to say is yeah i i hope that your kids do well too that's right and i hope that and if that's in a public school well whatever whatever your choice is because the right now it, more than 80 percent of all of our kids are in public schools mm-hmm. um i hope they're in great schools really right like um I think that a lot of them are not, and so then what, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. And by the way, there are kids in schools of choice that are also not in great situations, right? And so, to me, it, it, that's an that's just an honest thing to say. And I think that you can say, um, like, we can hold both of these things in tension. I really deeply believe in the power of school choice. Um, in in a roundabout way, it kind of impacted my own my own life and educational journey i think it can do the same for uh other families and also one of those ways that we found school choice when i was a kid is that we moved from new york to georgia i went to a public high school that was much better than any of the public school options where i lived in new york Mm -hmm. and and it was great and it was a public school so like i'm not going to be the one running around saying we need to we need to shut the doors on all public schools like mine was a mine served us well was it perfect no but it served us really well um all we had to do was drive like 1500 miles on i-95 and and get there Mm -hmm. um (laughs) 
and which is not the best. It's a heck of a commute. <laughs> it's a heck of a commute. Is not the best option, but that is one of the original forms of school of choice, right? You move to a different place, right? Um, right. Or stay in a place, which is what I've done. I mean. I live outside of Louisville, and one of the biggest reasons is because I didn't want to deal with navigating Jefferson County Public Schools. Some right. great schools, some great right. teachers. There's some also some really bad bad issues and and some real dysfunction, especially lately. Um, and so, yeah, I've stayed where I where I live, um, and and that is uh, in large part to that. So one one thing that that I, I'm wondering is. What would be, in your sense, an an ideal situation? You need to talk about you know public and private and charter. Like, what would be an outcome that AFC would say if we could get it to this? Hmm. This would be we, we we would cease to function. I mean, that that's what an advocacy yeah, yeah. group should be actually after, right? Yep. Yeah. We should put our we should put ourselves out of work. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I I think um, having. Um, laws in if we had laws in every state and now we've got them in a majority of states by the way Mm -hmm. um but if we had laws in every state that allowed families to um take to to use the the dollars use the funds that are already uh frankly constitutionally required to be spent educating their children because right, every state has a has constitutional provisions to do this. If families in every state had the ability to take those funds that were guaranteed to them and use it in the setting of their choice, um, I, I think that would be, I think we'd be pretty close to, to shutting the doors. Um, now, that sounds really simple. Um, having worked in lots of state legislatures, I know that's where the sausage gets made, right? And so that's where we start asking questions as the conversation you and I were having around, well, what are the quality metrics? Mm-hmm. Um, is that is it testing accountability? Uh, maybe I, I think that's probably part of it. I think parental satisfaction has is definitely got to be part of it. I think that's really important. Um, you know, so what are the what are the outcomes for kids? Because that's the, at the end of the day what we care about: outcomes for kids. And I think we have to honor parent voice in that. Um, and take parents very seriously if they say, I know that this might look good to the outside, but actually I'm with this child and they are in my care and uh, he or she's not doing well. I think we have to make space to to really honor that. So, you know, we've only got about like I don't know, 23, 24 states left to go and <laughs> we might be there. Would you say, uh, and I don't want to wrap up here, I'm honoring your time, but um, one of the books I'm, I've just read in preparation for a podcast coming up is uh, by Rick Hess and I want to say Mike McShane, yeah. I may be getting that wrong, yeah, from AEI. Right. Um, I think it's the book is called Getting School Right or something to that effect, and they're making allusions to conservative uh, conservative vision, of which I think the school choice is at least coded. School choice movement is, is coded you know, sort of more right leaning, but one of the things that he mentions in there, and you know, some some things that he talks about, or they talk about, is you know, I sort of chuckle as like heresy, right? To say you know some complexity and nuance, but he says you know, school choice is important, but it's not a panacea. It's not going to solve all the problems, and yep. so you wouldn't you wouldn't uh, disagree with that. No, and I and I I like both Rick and and Mike, and actually it was part of like a a book club. Um, reading that, reading that book, and um, and very little of it, as you know, has to do with school choice. Mm-hmm. Very little of that book, right? There's stuff about um, teacher prep. There's stuff about, yeah, um, yeah, you know, higher ed stuff. Uh, there's stuff I think even about pre K, sort sort of early education, mm-hmm. right? So, yeah, school choice is not a panacea. Um, but I think it's one of the most powerful levers that we've got mm-hmm. uh, in terms of advancing the ball. Um, and and I also think that even though those two those guys wrote this book and it's for a more conservative audience, um, I don't think that school choice is inherently right or left. And we've actually seen a little bit of that this week uh, in Louisiana. You had um, a bipartisan support of a new, you know, pretty expansive school choice measure 
and there were um, there were some more you know progressive members, some uh, more progressive Democrats, who sort of put their hands in the air and said, you know, we're just sort of tired with the the status quo, with the way things are, mm. um, and and so let's try to change it. And I sort of think like that to me, that's innovation, and innovation is not partisan. Um, if anything, as we're seeing in our, our national um, electoral politics, um, partisanship can be really stodgy and status quo, right? <laughs> um, and so innovation doesn't have to be doesn't have to be partisan. But yeah, I think it's I think it's a super strong lever, um, and there will still be more work to be done on a daily basis by great teachers, by parents being engaged, by great school leaders, um, et cetera. Okay. Well, uh, one last question before I give you an opportunity to share any links or say anything we didn't talk about or that kind of thing. Um, what do you think the chances are this Kentucky bill, uh, or the, I guess the amendment gets, gets, uh, ratified, which would, I suppose, make mm-hmm. school choice, uh, a bit more realistic here in Kentucky. Yeah. I, I think it has um, a pretty strong chance of passing in November. Um, it's going directly, directly to the ballot, which means that voters get to get to decide. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you're likely going to see pretty strong turnout because it's a presidential year. Mm-hmm. But um, this issue has got at least at the level of generality that this ballot um, initiative language has taken. Um, there's pretty widespread support. Mm -hmm. So there's over, for instance, 70% of African-American families support being able to use um, public dollars to go to the school of their choice. Mm -hmm. This is a sort of national polling. Um, It it really cuts across ideological, economic, um, race lines. The the, uh, lowest amount of support it tends to be among progressive uh, upper income whites, which I think is really interesting. Mm-hmm. I would say, yeah, that's because that's a demographic that by and large has already figured out the system for themselves and their families. And for whatever reason is just not attuned to this issue. Mm-hmm. Um, but by and large, this really cuts across demographics. So I think it's got a pretty significant chance of uh, or a pretty good chance of, of passing. But then it's still going to be up to the legislature to decide what to do with that, right? So if this ballot initiative passes, it doesn't automatically mean that there's a voucher program or an education savings account program. The legislature would still, the General Assembly would still have to come back and decide, all right, what what shape and what form does this take? Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, I, I would say keep an eye on it for the next few years. Yeah, well, it will be interesting in, in how it gets coded and the narrative that gets around it. Uh, I would say those those progressive uh, liberal white households that are anti school choice are probably against it because their their tribe says they're supposed to be, and mm-hmm. that to me mm-hmm. seems to be you know operating system that most people it's like what does my tribe say yeah. where do I lot draw the battle lines and then I must fight and yeah. it will be interesting because I'm sure it will be coded it'll be narrated it'll be you know this is anti public education this is I hate kids and you know all of that that language that'll be thrown around and and I you know I I again I'm I'm an advocate in many ways for school choice I do have some real concerns and because of the the sort of boundaries or what feels like a lack of boundaries between uh, public and, and, you know, sort of separation of church and state, religious money and that kind of thing, religious institutions, that kind of thing. And add to that my distrust of, based on what I've seen from the Kentucky GOP, uh, which, you know, seems in many ways like a clown show unfortunately it's like okay i'm not sure i'm willing to to (laughs) give the keys to the castle to to this group and uh in some ways it feels that that would be the case and i would imagine some some other folks might might get that as well but uh what else uh so the the website is federationforchildren.org what else uh, do you want them to know and hear and uh, visit and all those kinds of things yeah thanks well thanks for having me andrea i've really appreciated our conversation and um you know hopefully it it's kind of a model for how people can can talk about these kinds of things because i do think um this is the kind of 
uh, gem that you got to rotate a little bit to see it from all the different angles. Mm-hmm. And and there are a lot. Uh, anytime we talk about education, um, one of the things I always encourage uh, uh, families to do is to get to know your own school. So whether or not that's the the zone school, the charter, the private homeschool co-ops, et cetera, like get to know. I do think that parent engagement is super important. And um, uh, so I think that we've got to have the freedom to choose, but I think that also comes with a responsibility. And um, so I encourage parents to get to know their schools and would encourage your listeners to to do that. Um, and then I also encourage parents to say, like, just because you made a choice for your child doesn't mean that you've got the right to stand in the way and block another person's choice. And that's really hard because when we make a, a decision for our our own kids, um, we're really invested in that. But um, you know, my I've got one of my one of my daughters is uh, you know, she does ballet and just because she does ballet doesn't mean that every other nine year old girl needs to do ballet. Right. And if you want your kid to do something wildly different, fantastic. I'm not going to get it in the way. Um, and that's kind of, that's one way that I think like practically about school choice is um, to sort of, uh, how do I give somebody else the space to do something that would really benefit their family, even if I would make a very different decision for myself? Um, yeah. But if folks want to check out Federation for Children.org, they're welcome to do that. And, um, you know, personally, I'll say if, if uh, folks are welcome to check out the things that I write on, uh, I've got a sub stack and so I post articles there and it's just Shaka Mitchell um, uh, and you can subscribe there and I promise I won't um, send you too many videos of like cat memes or anything like that. <laughs> um, but I just, you know, I write mostly about education, but some other things from time to time as well. Okay, well, um, Shaka, I, I appreciate the time and the conversation. Certainly an important topic. And um, yeah, as you said, we've got to be able to have conversations and look at the different perspectives and and uh, do that in a way that will hopefully help us move this forward. So appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much, Jim. What we need to do is spend enough time together that we can start to translate our ideas into each other's language and include one another in this community of inquiry. And that is the work of love.